want to find out more about you personally okay. and um, get a little bit of your background. So I know that you're a coach, you're a business coach, a success coach, and um, you primarily coach women. Um, but I want to know, how did you get there? So you're the lady, you're the success lady, successful lady that teaches other ladies how to be successful. But how did you get there? What did you do before you were a coach? So I was straight out of college. I was working. Uh, I got this hot shit academic job doing, doing research straight out of undergraduate that should have been like a graduate level position. And I thought I was all that and more, but I hated it. It was boring. The people were boring. It was sucking the lifeblood out of me. So I had this side gig where I worked in a retail shop and it was like an ethnic arts retail shop. And I had never done that before, but it turns out I really liked being in sales. Like I liked talking to people. I liked flirting with people, men, women, all, all the above. Like it was just like, exciting and fun and great. And then I realized that I didn't want to, and at the time I was in my early twenties, I didn't want to grow up, get married, have kids, white picket fence, that like version of life that- The script. Know, the script. Yeah. I didn't want that if I'd never lived in New York, right? I wanted to live in New York, so I- Where were you living at the time? Living in California, I was living in Berkeley. And I moved to New York. I sold my car, moved to New York, sold everything, little bag in hand. That's pretty bold. Pretty bold. And I spent about three and a half months there. I didn't, I knew like a handful of friends of friends, but I didn't really know people. I had one friend there and she got very tired of me sleeping on her floor um, after a very short period of time. And then like I moved in, I found an apartment. I moved in with someone who had just, you know, was a dancer and she had just like quit drinking alcohol, doing drugs, like everything she had just quit. And she was like a crazy person and I couldn't <laughs> I had to, like extract myself. So I had a friend who lived in Berlin. I, I He had been an exchange student in, in my life. And so he invited me to Berlin. So I packed up, I left, I went to wow, Berlin. Wow, seeing a pattern here. <laughs> Let's go. So, and that was great. And I had all sorts of wild adventures in Berlin. And then I had to decide whether I was going to stay there and really learn the language and start a life or come back to the States. And I decided to come back to the States at $75 in my bank account. And Did I- you go back to New York? No, I went back to California and back to Berkeley. I had gotten New York out of my system, sort of. There's like, we could talk for hours yeah. about the adventures in New York. They, mm -hmm. There was like- Oh my God, so many adventures. Um, but I got back to California, I needed to make money. So I started temping and I worked for a, a startup company and I worked there for really three weeks, four weeks, something like that. And the Lori Allen, the HR person uh, hired me the day they went public. She was like, we need to hire you today so that you get stock options. And I had no, I, I wow. had no idea what that meant, but it was, fantastic. And I stayed at that company. I worked my way up the corporate ladder. I just kept taking on jobs because it was a startup. You know, everything just was like growing like gangbusters. And then I eventually started consulting in that world and got hired at different places and all that. But that allowed me to, that really launched my, my corporate career. And then when the tech bubble burst, there was the whole downturn as well. And I got a great severance package. I was like, sign me up. Did you that like it. that part before the tech bubble burst? Did you like what you were doing there? You know, Christina, I've always had a really good attitude about what, like how to approach life. So yeah, I loved it. I was working way too many hours. I had no sense of boundaries. I had given myself neck pain, back pain, I lost feeling in my fingertips. Like there was all sorts of unhealthy things about it. But did I love doing the work? Yes. Did I love the people? Yes. Um, did I learn a lot about you know, how to make presentations? I mean, there was all sorts of transferable skills. You know, I was working at a very high level there, you know, with the CEO and CFO. And like, there was like, it was fun. It was, yeah. it was an adventure. Um, but when it was time to go, it's time to go. And then I was like, what am I going to do with my life? And 
uh, you know, when you have everything in front of you, it's, it's like world's your oyster, but you have, I didn't really have a lot of direction. I was like lost. I did a lot of laundry. You know? How old were you at that point? Early thirties. And what did your parents have to say about the, you know, dropping everything and moving to New York and then moving to Berlin and the kind of nomadic lifestyle you had? Did, did they? I mean, that was just a short little blip in my world, okay. in my life. But um, what did they have to say? I don't, I, clearly it wasn't significant enough to stop me. Uh, if I had to guess what they would have said, my father would have been very supportive of the adventure, um, and my mother would have been full of worry. You know? <laughs> um, but those are the two options, right? Those are the, the those are well. Those are at least well, the pattern. One of each. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, she, my mother was never not really supportive, but it wasn't her like she just. Why are you doing this? Kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I find parents often they're thinking of themselves. They love you. They're worried about you. They just want you to be safe and, and not have to worry about you. So mm -hmm. in so doing, they sometimes unintentionally try to get you to repress those those urgents that you have, right? To move or, you know, whatever, to do something crazy like that, that or at least what some people perceive to be crazy. Ray is running off to Berlin. But you obviously um, didn't let that stop you. So no. what did you, what was your next path after the tech bubble burst and you had to find something else to do? Yeah, so I had to solve my uh, physical ailment issue. I had this incredible neck pain and back pain and I had lost feeling in my fingertips. And I looked into alternative um, to Western medicine options for that because the advice I was getting was just take two Advil. Mm -hmm. and that was yeah. not, that was not really cutting it as a solution. It was like solving like a temporary bomb, but it wasn't the solution. So I found something called the Alexander technique. And I remember going to my first session and this woman had this beautiful house and she had this gorgeous garden in the backyard and this studio and she was incredibly poised and graceful and I felt like gawky and you know unpoised mm -hmm. and I was like wow she can make a living doing this this seems really awesome I want this I want this lifestyle so, so what, what is the Alexander technique it is a mind body practice that you learn and it teaches you how to think differently about how you're you're responding to your to the stimuli of the world. Okay, so let's say you have the idea to sit or stand. Right, that's a thought. That's a stimulus. You go into an automatic pattern on how to do that. That's like a physical movement, and it happens in a split second. Mm -hmm. But if you can um, kind of create a little gap there that allows you to um, choose differently in the moment, then you can create a different pattern in your life. And I used it for creating new patterns of movement so that I wasn't, you know, slumping at my computer or really super tense in reaction to the world and what I was doing. Well, but it's interesting. That doesn't sound, sounds like what you do now, except not, maybe not your physical body, but your, what's going on internally and mentally. Absolutely. It's not, dissimilar okay that the, the 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 it's great that you're asking about this evolution because it's very much part of how I think I was able to take what I teach now and really uh, apply it um, quickly in my life because I had the skill set of how to stop and make a different choice in the moment because that's what I really ultimately learned from the Alexander technique I, I entered that world from a physical pain perspective but I ended up using it for really everything in my life um, to get out of you know the automatic patterns so then tell me how did you I'm assuming and you can correct me if I'm wrong that you then eased into the coaching so tell me how that happened so I've always been very interested in personal development I think that most of the women who 
come to me for business coaching or success coaching or want to achieve something in their lives, they have been um, searching for how to be more successful in their lives, how to feel better, how not to feel like they're always like behind or not doing enough or not good enough or whatever. You, you know, the, yeah. it's something that I've looked at for years and years and years. And so I would have private clients and they would come to my studio. So, you know, that story about going to that woman's studio, I created that, like talk about like manifestation. Like I, I bought a house, created a garden, there was a studio, created a teaching studio. Like I recreated that vision for myself and totally made that happen. And when clients would come after a few years of doing this, so so one of the ways that I got into business coaching was I had to figure out how to run my own business. Like yeah. I had gone to training to, to, to learn this for three years, but there was no business training involved in it. It was sort of like, okay, go, go have a business. And Quite frankly, the the going rate and how much people were making in my industry was when I realized what it was, was like not acceptable to me. Like I was not, um, I was not willing to not make really good money. So yeah. I started learning and taking classes and studying and, and just diving into the marketing and the business development the sales side, all of that. Like, how do you, how do you actually do this? And so that, that's where I got initially some of my chops in terms of um, business and, and, and um, marketing and sales uh, training was just having to learn it for myself. And I ended up being very successful at it um, in a very short period of time. But, you know, into my, the later years of doing this in that, that business, I started taking the stuff that I was learning in the personal development world and asking my clients, you know, would you be interested if I explored this with you? It's not the strict, um, you know, strictly what yeah. I'm here for, but are you interested in this? And some of them said yes. And so I would do that with them and had this, this great um, rapport with people so I could get a lot of feedback in terms of cause and effect, like what was working and what wasn't working. And quite frankly, and this is so interesting that we're talking about this because I never talk about this, Christina. It's like a whole lifetime ago, okay? Um, but that technique was a very hands-on technique. So I would, uh, one part of the training was being able to put your hands on someone and guide them and, and understand what was happening inside of them even if they didn't notice what was happening. Like this very highly attuned sense of, of what was going on. So I would be in conversation with people and doing this personal development work and I could feel the changes in people's body. And, and when they were actually in what I now know to be like a double bind message, they're saying one thing, but they are believing something else. Okay. And it causes conflict in, in the body, or you could say it's in your energy body or whatever. I can feel it across the room from someone now. Okay. Wow. Like, yeah. And that's because I mean, people come to this knowledge in different ways, but the way I came to it was through the the Alexander technique and learning that and really being becoming masterful at it. So, so then, did you just basically your did your business converted at that point into being a business coach? Yeah. So it's a little bit interesting. We moved across the country, and some of my clients uh, came with me and started. The, the ones who were into the personal development work, they became what you would call like life coach, coaching clients, right? Yeah. We started working over Skype instead of in person. And it wasn't really the Alexander technique per se. It was all this other stuff that we were working on. So there was a natural evolution to that. And that was not business coaching. That was very much life coaching. Is that what you called yourself? A life coach? I didn't call myself anything at that time. I didn't know, like, I didn't put a title on. I had like a, just a handful of clients that kept, came with me, right? Yeah. And then once I moved, I had the choice of whether I was going to start the same business or a different business. And that's when I had to figure out, well, what the hell am I doing? So I, I didn't call my, I didn't give myself a title, but I realized that the market, the people that I knew were all the people that I had met in all the courses and the trainings and the programs and the events and the retreats I had gone to around learning business skills. And so these were all women in business. Some were men, but 
primarily women in business, were the ones that were hiring me when I hung out my shingle. Okay, when, when I was that? What year was that? How long ago? That was at least that was five or six years ago. Yeah. Oh wow! I thought it was. I thought you were going to say like ten or fifteen years ago. No, no. Wow. It was a very recent. Well depends on law of relativity, you know, depends on whether that's a long time or not a long time. Yeah. Well, I guess it doesn't seem that long because I thought it was longer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I guess it is relative. Yeah. It just and, seems and like so, you've accomplished so much in a short time. That's why I called my business, you know, I'm, I'm doing a brand shift right now, but uh, for years I called my business Quantum Leap Coaching because I, I'm all about doing it quickly. There's no need to... It doesn't have to take a long time. It doesn't have to, uh, you know, you can, you can create what you want very quickly. And we have this idea that it has to, you know, take you a long time to build a business. How long did it take you to build your, your law firm? Well, yeah, I guess you're right. Um, about five years. So about the time that I started my law firm, you were starting this, this, yeah. um, I guess we can call it a rebranding of your. Yeah, business. absolutely. And so, you know, the first year that I did it, I made 30 K. It was not like, like not significant, but the second year I tripled my income. And then the third year I did even better. And then I went to high six figures. That was a major breakthrough year. And then I crossed the seven figure mark and haven't gone back. So like, like that's a lot to accomplish in five years, but it didn't like, there was a, there's a ramp up here. There, there was like a, um, I needed to build like a learning curve. Yeah. I needed to build momentum. So even though in the first, the, in the second year, I guess I tripled my income. It was still, you know, under the six figure mark, but then it kept going and there's a, uh, and I learned a lot more, Christina, like I learned how to break through yeah. and, and really there was that. And that's what I bring to my coaching now is, is the methodology for how to break through. I hear that a lot that it's, easy it can be you know from you and from other coaches that it, it's easy to be financially successful in your business and I think until you've actually done it and I my business is you know successful enough but it's not where I want it to be and I so for someone like me who wants something much greater and I know there's a lot of other people like me out there how it's kind of hard to really understand what you mean when you say that it's easy. So we live in an easy universe. There's nothing about this life, this world that we live in that needs to be hard, except we make it so. Okay. How we, do we do that? Well, it's our conditioning and our programming. So we, most of us were raised by other beautiful humans who have the same framework of like, it's so hard. It's such a struggle. It, it's, you know, and like it's a grind and we're, we, we see it that way. So we create it that way. Okay. That's all we know. But if, let, let me break this down and give you an example. So you're stuck in traffic. Okay. And you can either see that as horrible and hard and sucky and it's not letting you get what you want or you can look at it and go okay I'm going to put my podcast on and I'm going to learn something new and and it can be um two hours but you're totally involved and happy and having a good time and really quite easy and you get home and no big deal right this like, very thing just happened to me I know that's why I use this example okay <laughs> that's why it popped into my head but I mean it's the same experience of being stuck in traffic but how do you how do you respond to it? Okay. Like it's not that my life doesn't have circumstances or events or things that um, could be a struggle or could be hard, but how you respond to it is what makes it easier hard. Okay. And so, and, and, and it's what allows you to see opportunities in front of you. Okay. So mm, in my business, when I am uh, fighting something or in struggle with something or think something's hard, I don't see the opportunities. I don't see the solutions. I don't see the easy, easy ways. When I am 
in my delighted state, which is most of the time now, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and having a good time and jamming, it's like the answers just come like this. So easy. And, to, and taking action becomes easy as well because there's not this um, mindset of this has to be hard. I have to feel guilty. I have to feel shame. I have to um, uh, struggle. I have to feel bad. One of the things I say to myself is heaven is my natural state. Like anytime that I am thrown out of heaven, that is something I'm creating for myself. That is my, that is a story that has been programmed and I am creating that. that I don't, I don't need to experience life that way. And, yeah. and it's a very powerful stance because, and I will hear a lot of people say, you know, what about this? And what about this? And yeah, hard things happen. Okay. You can still, you still have a choice about how you respond. I think it's really hard for people that are stuck in that type of mindset where maybe they're accustomed to complaining. And every time some, you know, a problem comes up, that's exactly what it is. It's a problem. And then we have to whine about it. And I've fallen into this myself. And mm -hmm. I think I've just, by doing some of the coaching that I've done with you and with other people and just trying to be more mindful of that, I definitely have, I'm doing that much less. And I find myself being happier mm -hmm. and catching myself more when I'm doing it, like for instance, before this video started, before you got on, I have a light and the light went out. The battery died. It's been, I've been sitting here for a half an hour. I had turned it off not to drain the battery. I turned it on and the light goes out. And my initial thought was, I can't believe this. I've been sitting here for an hour prepping for this. And now the video, now there's a tech problem. Why couldn't that have happened before? So I, but I caught myself, I caught mm -hmm. myself, you know, getting into like that whininess, you know, and then I thought, okay, this is stupid. I'm not going to now spend 10 minutes complaining about how the universe hates me. <laughs> and I plugged it in and it's all fine now. So, I mean, ge so generally is that really, I mean, that's a minor problem, but generally is that how we should approach our problems? Absolutely. You know, like, one of the things that I say is if you're not laughing, you're, something's, something's yeah. off, right? Yeah. You know, like it's, it's all good. Just have a good time. Like, and I know that seems so pat. Okay. I know it seems like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your life is so great. You're making all this money. You have all this freedom. You can be delighted. You can yeah. laugh at it. You can have fun, but that's the, but that's a misconception. What I did first was I decided to change my attitude. I decided yeah. to change my mindset. I decided to change my response to what was going on in my life and quite frankly, hold myself to a higher standard, right? Like every time I went into what you're talking about, I just was like, okay, I'm gonna change this right now. Like, and I started feeling better and then things like opened up and great opportunities showed up and, and the answers and all of that. So. Yeah. So you've spent um, basically the past five plus years coaching primarily women. Correct. And you are a woman. So I'd like to hear, in your opinion, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges that women specifically face? Is there a common thread that you see with the women that you coach? Absolutely. So I think this is a really interesting question because it's a it is a human dilemma, like a human situation. Uh, it's not only women that experience this. However, women have a particular flavor to it, and uh, and it shows up for them in in different ways. So primarily, the you know the front door that people come to me for like what they why they want to work with me is they want to have a quantum leap financially they want to make a hell of a lot more money right now in their business okay and i absolutely believe in the power of financial freedom like you need the financial freedom that you want in order to follow your purpose in this world to be able to do the things that you want to do so a perfect example of that would be 
if you don't feel like you have the money to, let's say, um, buy that new dress, so you don't buy it, and then you feel bad about your clothes and how you look, and then you go into that um, meeting and you're feeling bad about how you look, and then you don't make the sale because of that. It's very indirect, okay? Yeah. But then if you have money, you go buy that dress and you feel great about it, and then you make that sale, right? And it's a yeah. follow up on kind of experience. Now, the challenge is most people don't spend money on themselves until they have it. Okay. And I'm not arguing for being flip with your, your finances, but you actually have to step into the truth that, that all the money that ever was and ever will be is here now. And if you step forward into a true desire for something you want, not, not a scarcity based desire, but, or a fear based desire, but a true desire for what you want. And you then do the work in your world, in your life, in your business, like you're not abdicating action. Okay. You yeah. will, it will, um, cause you to grow into more and you'll be able to receive more. There's a lot more to that, but that is, yeah. you know, the fundamentals of it. And so initially people come to me because they say they want to make more money, which again, I agree, it's hugely important. But the reason behind uh, making more money is, is a kind of freedom that goes even beyond finances. Okay, so having, let me just tell you, having financial freedom is fucking kick ass, okay? It's like, I want it for everyone, all women, everywhere, right? Like it, it allows you to do what you want when you want it and have what you want when you want it, right? It's amazing. However, what I think most women want is the ability to um, not feel constrained in their lives in any way. Okay, like not f feel small or unworthy or not good enough or uh, rejected I mean, with respect to their relationships, not just romantic relationships, but with other people too, like maybe their parents or colleagues or all of that family members. So, what I see happening is when you don't have control over your finances, then let's say you have um, a, a team member that's not performing particularly well, but you think I can't afford to hire someone better because it costs more and I'm not, I don't know how to make more money. I don't know the fundamentals of what calls in money in this world or what, what the mechanisms are for that. Then you feel trapped in that relationship. Okay, you feel like you can't say directly to that person, you're not performing this way, I need you to show up this way, right? You hold back, you feel like there's something that you could possibly lose in the world, okay? When in truth, there is nothing you can lose. There's no scarcity here, okay? You, you are creating the story of scarcity and that you could lose something. Does this make sense? Yeah. Yeah. And what about it? What I found uh, sometimes what I observe and, you know, I think I've been through this, but I definitely see it with a lot of my colleagues is not wanting to hurt someone's feelings. Um, in fact, I'd love to know what you think about this. I, I know someone who wants to fire her associate. She's made a decision. She wants to fire her, but tomorrow's Thanksgiving. So she didn't fire her today. But then her question was, well, when should I fire her? Friday seems insensitive. Should I fire her Monday or Tuesday? And then there was this whole debate on this Facebook group amongst all women, mm -hmm. when to fire this person. And, and it seemed to me that it was completely centered on not hurting her feelings. And I said, you're going to hurt her feelings no matter what day it is. Fire her on Friday. You know, maybe you're doing her a favor. Yeah, absolutely. Thoughts about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, nobody can hurt your feelings but yourself. Okay, so you can't. You're responsible. She's responsible to that person, but not for that person. Okay, so how that person responds to being let go is completely up to to that person, that associate. Okay, so however, the the lawyer, your colleague 
needs to get a handle of how, on how she's showing up because there's a vibration of mm, wrongness, like she's wrong for doing this. Yes, okay. yes. And she needs to get a handle on that and get very clear about like, this isn't, this isn't wrong, okay? This isn't showing, she's not doing anything wrong here because her vibration of doing something wrong is what's going to hurt that person's feelings. That's what they're going to pick up on. Does that make sense? Yeah, that does. Okay. So if, if she can show up very cleanly, very clearly and say, you know, I like to use the concept of the feedback sandwich, you know, something positive. This is, this is the perhaps uh, hard to take bit and then something positive. So I've really appreciated all the, the conscientious work that you've done and how you've shown up in this way, this way, and this way. However, I don't feel it's a right fit for you to stay with the firm because of X, Y, and Z. And as of today, we're giving you two weeks notice and you can uh, wrap things up for us. And I also want to just acknowledge that you've been with us for three years and you've accomplished this, this, and this. And we are very appreciative of that, even though this isn't working. There is no wonk. Okay. Did you hear? Yeah. There is zero wonkiness in that yeah. statement. That takes you know, five minutes, 10 minutes to prep for that conversation. Okay. But like, it's really stepping out of the fact that you are doing something wrong. This is not wrong. Okay. Unless it is wrong. You know, I'm not in that person's yeah. situation, but it sounds like, you know, some things work out, some things don't work out. And can you talk a little bit about something we talked about earlier is women in particular having guilt about a lot of things just I feel like women feel so guilty about everything you know if you eat a cupcake you feel guilty if you show up late for something you feel guilty if you you know do something nice for yourself and you know didn't pick up your kid from school and ask someone else to do it and you feel guilty yeah I just feel like everything every day is about feeling guilty about something and you had some opinions about that well, guilt and shame are one of the big things that keep us locked in old patterns and keep us hooked in our programming, okay? So our subconscious mind got programmed when we were very young with a particular pattern on how to behave, how to do things, how to do life. And now that we're an adult, we don't really, um, we could choose to, to uh, run our lives differently, but we're hooked into this old pattern, okay? Because our subconscious, that's all it knows and it thinks that, very black and white. It thinks that if we leave that pattern, that it's going to be, we're going to die. Okay. We're going to like, like it does not, it, it, our brains are, are programmed to this part of our brain. It's our brain stem only do things that we have survived before. So any change from what's up until now existed, it will think of as, um, potential death like you so might want to keep everything the same yeah I call it safe and sane okay and so one of the mechanisms with which it it does this is by guilting us okay so don't do this it, it knows that you are going to stop what you're doing when you feel guilty okay so it's a mechanism to keep you from changing so you just you just recognize that's guilt okay and what can I do it differently how can I respond differently? Do I have to go forward like that? Probably not. Okay. So um, I was thinking about you. This is like kind of going off a little bit on a tangent, but I um, have you been following Megan Kelly at all in the news? Mm -mm. Okay. Well, she was an anchor. Um, you know who she is, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So she was an anchor on the Today Show, and she made she made a reference that um, was inappropriate. It's, she made a reference that um, it was okay for people to do blackface for Halloween. And she was removed from the show for mm -hmm. that. Um, I, and I was kind of wondering, you know, if there was someone, maybe not her specifically, but if there was someone who had experienced something like that where they were ostracized because of a comment that they made something inappropriate that they said or did um 
because we all do that, right? At some point, um, we say something that is not meant too kindly with other people. And maybe if we didn't mean to offend someone, we did. Um, when we have blips like that on the screen, and I guess if you were coaching Megan Kelly, you know, what, what would you tell her to, as far as getting past that? Because that's a pretty major obstacle. She might be feeling like, or anyone who experiences something like that, my career is over. I'm never going to recover from this mistake. You know, I'm done. I'm going to have to find something else to do. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. So the first thing I would advise her to do is 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 to to take the personal responsibility that she needs to take for this. So oftentimes we get stuck in pointing fingers or being a victim or wronging, you know, they're wrong for telling me that I'm wrong kind of thing. And, and that just keeps you stuck and locked into a situation. I don't care if you're talking about a relationship with your, your partner, your husband, the, the other anchor, right? Yeah. Or, Trying to defend yourself. Correct. So in, in order to step out of that hook, okay, that cycle, and which is really going to keep you locked exactly where you are. You have to step out of, you know, wronging yourself, wronging the other person. You do that by taking personal responsibility. What do I own here? And, and what do I need to learn here? And how can I show up and take full responsibility, 100% personal responsibility for my actions, my life, my beliefs, my understandings, okay? That would be a huge first step. Then the second step would be to start creating a vision of what she really wants in her life. And, and and to stop saying, you know, we're imagining what's in her head, but yeah. stop saying what you just said, which was, you know, my career's over. And instead, you know, be committed to what you want. If she still wants that career, like keep that clear and and um, and crystallized and get really clear about that and be unstoppable around it. Like just keep going, okay? And And understand that opportunity often comes in the form of misfortune. So to, to not look at this, this is the law of relativity also, like not to look at this in like my career is over kind of way, or this is just like the worst thing that could possibly happen to me. What if it wasn't? What if it really, what, what if this, and this is where you, ha you have to do the inner work to be able to see the opportunity and not to be in the, the freak out about it. Yeah. But, you know, this could, this could open a huge number of doors for her in, in a number of different ways, if she does take the personal responsibility, if she takes, if she steps out of the wronging, if she really goes forward there. Thank you for sharing that. I think that's applicable to all of us if we, if our business isn't doing well. Maybe if it's maybe even if you end up having to close your business, it fails um, financially. Um, I think that we could all learn from that. That we we don't have to give up our dream. I don't know if I opened up a spa and. For whatever reason, it didn't work out. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm ne I have to abandon my dream of owning a spa, right? right. Um, so what's next for you? What are your personal goals? Do you see yourself coaching until you're a little old lady? Is there <laughs> you know, some other vision that you have for yourself that you want to share? I'd love to hear it. That's great. I think I have found my genius work and my purpose and like, it's just going to get better and better. And in, in the same lane, what that looks like in five or 10 years, I'm not sure. Uh, right now I'm really focused on building this movement, the unstoppable woman movement, which is really about helping women free themselves from the guilt and shame that we've been talking about all the things, the mindsets, the programming, how we were raised that keep us small and stuck and really helping them step into like an unlimited uncompromised, unstoppable life. And of course, the front door for that is the business coaching that I do. Like, let's rock it out financially. Um, let me show you how to do that. But then what happens when you do the work, the internal work to make these big quantum leaps is that you start seeing how um, there are other places in your life that are just not acceptable to you right now. And like, they have to change. And you start showing up that way and then it just gets better and better and better. And I just like, I want that for everyone. Like I want to help women transform their lives and have, you know, it's a little bit pat. It's a little bit uh, perhaps overdone, but this idea of like, you can have it all right. We were, we were told we could have it all. And yet we were also told 
subliminally the double bind message of like, no, 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 you really can't. You have to compromise here and you have to compromise here. And you have to make yourself small here and you can't go for it over here. And I just want to give all of that the big middle finger and show people, yeah. you know, show people like, actually, if you're willing to face your fears, right, and work through the deeper stuff that keeps you stuck, you, you can have it all. Like, it's really, it's possible. So. Well, I'm happy to hear that because I, you know, I do think that, but then there are times that, you know, maybe there's an obstacle that presents itself and, or there's a failure and I will think to myself, I'll allow myself to think, well, you know, maybe I can't, mm -hmm. or maybe that's just a fantasy. Yeah. And that's what you need to learn how to step out of right there. Okay. Like it's true. That's how we were programmed. That's, that's very common. And also like, what if that was a lie, Christina? Okay. Yeah. So tell me about the Unstoppable Woman Summit that's happening. Thank you. So that's coming right up. It's December 5th, 6th, and 7th. It's in San Diego, California, and it's going to be fantastic. I would love for people to, to find out more about it. I think you can share, share a link on that. Yeah, I can um, do that. That would be fantastic. It's going to be about how to create what you want in your life. So we're going to be diving into exactly what you want, whether it's on the business side, which I love to work on. I love to help women get really super clear about what, what needs to happen in their, what they want in their business and what needs to happen to, to create that. And then walking people through all the phases of creation, including the denial phase where we get in our own way, which is a little bit about what we were talking about here yeah. and all the ways that we do that and how to step out of it and really start manifesting or creating exactly what you want faster and faster and faster. Okay. And that's the idea. It's like, let's, let's, let's get clear about what you want and let's figure out how to create it. And I take people through a whole um, methodology for how to do that and do it quickly and uh, consistently. So sorry. Awesome. About I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait. And I, I would love to hear more of your stories, but unfortunately we don't have enough time for all that. So <laughs> maybe another day. Um, but I like to end my interviews with one question. And that is, if you could go back in time, mm -hmm. what advice would you give your 18 year old self? Wow. The first thing I, I got two hits there, go for it. And you're beautiful. I was so insecure. Simple. Yeah. I was so insecure. And if I could just, you know, I wish I knew uh, and had the sort of self-esteem and self-confidence that I have now, then yeah. I think that would have been really. Don't we all. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> totally. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Amir. I really appreciate you sharing all of that with me and with the world. Thank you. And I think that we're all going to get something out of that. You're really an interesting and inspiring person. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Have a good one.